here we go. Welcome everybody to another Big Ideas. I'm your host, Dr. Jeffrey Hanna, where we talk about nothing bigger in life than being able to help people with information that's going to help to improve their well-being, their quality of life, to be able to do the things that they really want to be able to do. And today we're looking at a very important one. And this one's particularly important because there is so terribly very little information it's not a formal diagnosis whatsoever, but it's actually a remarkably common symptom that people experience. And that is what we're going to be calling brain fog. And so I've only really been able to pull open, you know, one article that's been written on the topic and they don't really get into the, the causes of that. But nevertheless, I want to take you through some of the information that is available but then also describe to you at least one of the prevailing hypotheses is at least one of the contributing factors when it comes to brain fog. So here what we have, subjective cognitive dysfunction. Any a fancier scientific way to say, okay, my impression is I am feeling that my brain is not working properly in patients with and without fibromyalgia. Prevalence, predictors, correlates, and consequences. This one written back in uh, 2021. So what have we got? Subjective cognitive dysfunction is common in fibromyalgia where it has been called fibrofog, but its predictors and correlates are not well understood, including the extent to which brain fog, we'll say for simplicity, is present in fibromyalgia and non-fibromyalgia clinical populations. So what they did here is they did an assessment of over 11,000 people and they picked people with rheumatoid arthritis to see was this going to correlate with other kinds of symptoms, including fibromyalgia and then cognitive severity. That is, are they feeling that the brain's not working quite right? Now, here's what they found. 42 to 52% of people with fibromyalgia experienced issues that they felt was affecting how well they were able to use their brain. But you were also seeing that in somewhere between one and a half up to about five and a half percent of people without fibromyalgia. So it's not exclusive to only fibromyalgia. Although subjective cognitive dysfunction is called fibrofog, brain fog, in patients with the fibromyalgia, 44% of people who experience brain fog in some capacity occurs even though they don't experience fibromyalgia, which is full body pain, full body fatigue, trigger points, all that sort of stuff. So fibromyalgia and um, cognitive uh, dysfunction or cognitive severity are correlated, but appear to be different parts of a symptom severity continuum. Okay, interesting. Now, what does this actually tell us? Unfortunately, it doesn't tell us too terribly much. It gives us some interesting statistics no doubt about that. But really when it comes to what is the cause of people's brain fog and what are the solutions, well, they don't really talk about it in this particular article. So I'm actually going to be doing something slightly different in this video. I'm going to be building on this to make a case and to make a, an argument to propose a hypothesis as far as, you know, what's one of the possibilities here. Now, I'm not going to, per the usual, I am not going to read this article all aloud for you here, but what I wanted to point out a couple of things. Number one, the way that they're defining this subjective cognitive dysfunction is simply put people having trouble thinking or remembering. So oftentimes people will say to me that it's like my head is in a cloud. It's foggy. You can tell me something, but it's just sort of not registering or it's much harder for me to concentrate and even then I'm not absorbing it all. Or my short-term memory is not really good. I forget things easily. And it's a little bit more than having the odd senior moment when you go into the room and forget why you went in there in the first place. This is like a perpetual state of what am I doing here? What? Why? And the current state of the science provides no insight into the mechanistic nature of this brain fog phenomenon. So what they did in this particular research is they said, okay, well, we know that there's a, a bit of an association. People who are known diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis, 
they have a higher risk factor for chronic pain, chronic fatigue, and also brain fog. In other words, inflammation-related symptoms. And so what they did was they said, okay, well, we're going to take this collection of people here and we're going to see what's the prevalence in that population right then and there. And we want to see, you know, is it for people if they are experiencing, again, this full body pain fatigue, is that going to be what's higher associated or correlated with brain fog? Yes or no. And so there's our big population that they found right there. So over 11,000. So pretty good, uh, pretty good supplied of, uh, of people here to get good amount of data. And what did they find in a nutshell? In a nutshell, what they found was that when people experienced full body pain, fatigue, depression, all of that, that, that those things in and of itself were risk factors and were associated with higher levels of brain fog. Moreover, the more severe those symptoms, the fatigue, the pain, the depression, the greater the intensity of the brain fog. What they also found is that the more symptoms that people experienced, the higher the level and the more likely, again, that they were to experience something like brain fog. So there's a few interesting and important things that, you know, I want you to understand here as it relates to, to brain fog. Again, first and foremost, brain fog is not a diagnosis. It's a symptom. And all symptoms are effects. Effect of what? The honest answer is we don't know. The honest answer is we don't know what causes brain fog. But we understand that, that if there's going to be an effect, there has to be a cause for it. And there could be more than one cause. Now, in addition to that, when people experience multiple symptoms, so you go to your doctor, I have people come into my own practice, and you know, we have you fill out that initial health form to get a snapshot about what your health looks like. And we have people tick off dot, box after box after box after box after box. You know what? Odds are it's not that you have two dozen different things wrong with you. Odds are that what you've got is you have a common underlying cause that so happens to be producing any number of different symptoms. So we can focus on just trying to treat the end effects or we can try to give you the name of, well, what category or what label do we want to stick on your forehead? But in reality, that doesn't necessarily tell us what the cause of that is. So again, whether we're saying it's brain fog, fibro fog, or subjective cognitive dysfunction, to a certain degree, what's in a name? What's causing it? And what can you do about it? So when people experience more than one thing, Odds are, it's because there is a common link. And if we can understand and figure out what that common link is, that then gives us an opportunity to actually get to the root cause and treat the issue at its source. Now, where does that bring me back to looking at this particular data? Okay, what are we finding commonalities? We're finding pain is a commonality. We're finding fatigue is a commonality. Sleep is a commonality. And just because a person might say, yes, I get my seven and a half hours of sleep and I do it by taking drugs that knock me out, that just makes you unconscious. That does not necessarily mean that your brain and your body physiology are doing the normal repairs that they should be doing when they are asleep. It's to a certain degree why if a person has had an anesthetic and they've been knocked unconscious, why they're so perpetually groggy after that. You'd think, oh, you would have had a lovely sleep. No, that stays in their system and it takes a long time to recover from that. And then the other bits then are going to be affiliated with um, basically um, depression. And it's not always the, the clinical depression, I will say, but the feeling of being depressed. Now, this is important because we never want to confuse cause and effect. Well, why would that be? 
And the reason for that, simply put, is, well, find me a person who experiences full pain, isn't sleeping well, and is not having clarity in their mind. The person who's not depressed in that state, they're the abnormal one, to tell you the truth. So same thing, you can look at the depression, you can say, okay, that's a label. No, the depression is the effect. The effect of what? We don't know at this point, but we'll have a little look at that in just a moment. So what did the researchers in this particular study find? What they find was that there were these associations between these different symptoms. They don't go to the effect of saying what's causing them, but they're saying there is a known association. There are risk factors, namely, if you already experience fibromyalgia, but from a medical standpoint, we don't know what causes fibromyalgia. So we have an understanding about the end effect, but we don't really know the, the cause and the origin. But that it seems to be showing up in a number of different ways in terms of both psychological symptoms, anxiety, depression, lack of brain character, all of that sort of stuff, um, but also somatic symptoms. In other words, body symptoms. And I will often say that when we're dealing with these kinds of things, whether it's fibromyalgia, whether it's chronic fatigue, or whether it's something like brain fog, to a large degree what the nature of the issue is, is where your body is playing a trick on your brain. So what it is, what you are experiencing is very, very real, but your body is sending your brain faulty messages about something, and as a consequence of that, things are not working quite the way that they are supposed to. So we have these known associations. Now I'm going to branch off a little bit, just in terms of, a, again, a couple little hypotheses or hypotheses as it relates to brain fog and what you can be doing to look at them in terms of finding solutions. Now, I will start with this, that I'm not giving any personalized, you know, healthcare advice, but I'm looking to say, you know, where are the, some of the spots where you probably and may want to look. So first and foremost, one of the things that I find very interesting in this study here is that they're looking at people with rheumatoid arthritis. Well, rheumatoid arthritis is effectively an autoimmune condition that is pro-inflammatory. For some reason, your body is attacking itself and it's producing inflammation. Now, inflammation is a normal part of the healing process. If you cut your hand, for example, it needs to swell a little bit. It needs to have a perfusion of red blood cells, white blood cells, in order for healing and repair to actually happen. But if that pathway starts going a little bit crazy on hyperdrive, where it is chronically inflamed, well, that's not going to be a good thing because then your body's going to be in a constant state of stress, distress, repair, agitation, and what that's effectively going to do is that's going to drain your resources. That's the same thing as having a hole in the bottom of a boat and try as you might to flush the water out. It keeps coming into the boat faster than you can drain it out. So understanding of inflammation, very, very important then to understand body physiology and higher levels of inflammation is associated with just about any form of pathology that you can think of whether it's cardiovascular disease, diabetes, cancer, you name it, it's across the board. The question is just what tissue is being targeted and attacked. And we'll get to that in just a sec here. Now, when it comes also to understanding the modulation and the regulation of inflammation, this is done through what's called your autonomic nervous system. And it's going to be done in conjunction with hormones as well. But the primary governments is what's through your autonomic nerves. This is not about you cognitively thinking about things. This isn't about you moving things. This isn't about you feeling things. This is about the brain stem or the medulla, the survival centers of your brain, doing the work that keep you alive. Heart, lungs, digestive, reproduction function, that stuff.
Your sympathetics are about the activation. The activation of what? Smooth muscle. You see, every blood vessel in your entire body has a smooth muscle that's associated with it that controls how dilated it is or how constricted it is. And this openness or closedness is what's going to affect blood flow, so circulation. It's going to influence what is also called interstitial flow. That is the fluid of water and cleansing products that are involved with immune function into tissues and also out of tissues. And this is going to be very important in a sec because, I'll say it again, everywhere in your body where you have a blood vessel, an artery, a capillary, you've got an associated sympathetic nerve fiber that is controlling its function. In addition to that, you also have sympathetic fibers that go to all of the lymphatics, all of the lymphatic vessels which drain the and cleansing debris out of the interstitium, so out of your cells, out of your tissues, and into the veins so that they can ultimately be recycled and cleansed out of your body. That's what is essentially going to be cleansing toxins and again, you know, metabolic debris that's as a consequence of inflammation. Now, if and when you have imbalance of either the sympathetics, too much, too little, or the parasympathetics, too much, too little, based on normal circumstances, what's going to happen potentially is that you're going to have dysregulation of this blood vessel, this flow, the flow of blood in and also the lymphatic cleansing of stuff out of the tissues of your body. So I'm going to use your hand as an example. I want you to imagine that you have dysregulation of the blood that's supposed to go to your hand, but then also potentially dysregulation of the lymphatic cleansing stuff that's supposed to keep your hand nice and clean. Well, over a period of time, what's going to happen? Well, if you're not getting the right amount of supply to your hand, it's probably going to start to get a little bit white, maybe even a little bit blue. It's not getting normal blood flow. But in turn, if you're not actively cleansing and clearing the hand away, well, then it can start to become agitated, irritated. So instead of it living essentially in a pristine, clear water environment, your hand tissue cells are effectively living in a cesspool. Well, that's not going to be good because that invites damage, inflammation, debris. It's one of the reasons why diabetes, as an example, is such a serious condition. It's both a neurological but also a vascular issue where effectively your circulation is being affected at all levels. You're not getting the right quality of blood flow in, but you're also not cleansing it away properly either. And that's why people's limbs in particular are at such risk. Now thus far I've been talking about and using an example of a hand. Now what I want you to do is I want you to imagine that this is your brain. Okay? I want you to imagine that you've got a condition that so happens to be affecting the circulation, that is the blood flow to your brain or the lymphatic cleansing coming out from your brain. And this is where it's necessary to understand then the role of the upper neck. You see, first and foremost, those sympathetic fibers, you know, those ones that control blood vessel dilation, every single blood vessel that's in your head is actually influenced by a little cluster of cells that you have on the front part of your neck right about here. It's about the level of the C2, the C3, but it's a little bit deeper down in there. It's called the superior sympathetic ganglion. And this is going to give an array of fibers that go to every blood vessel and every lymphatic channel that is in your brain. Now, if and when people may have a neck-related injury, and they are very, very common. 
take a header off your bunk bed when you're a little kid, even delivery itself. You fall off your bike, sports injuries, car accidents, falling off a curb, tripping on a curb, smacking your head on a door. You know, these can all be little things, but added up over a period of time, they can actually lead to and contribute to a lot of damage in the neck. And so when people say, oh, okay, yeah, you've got a little bit of arthritis in your neck, it's like, okay, well, first and foremost, that's not supposed to be there. But the more damage that's actually accumulated, the more likely that the physical issue can actually start to affect the neurology because of its local proximity. Imagine, if you would, that you've got a pebble in your shoe. Okay, well, this isn't going to be a good thing. Why? Because what it's going to do is going to be a little bit of source of irritation. It's going to rub. And I want you to consider the way that you use your neck. Probably doing this, and this in front of the computer, a whole bunch. We as human beings, we don't take good care of our necks. We take good care of our teeth. We take good care of our bodies most of the time. But we really, unfortunately, do very, very little in terms of taking care of you know, the vital center that keeps us alive in the first place. Now, my point being is that if and when you actually have then something that's gone funny with your neck, and as we said, it can be a source of local irritation, if it so happens to affect the superior cervical ganglion, there can be a knock-on effect that will disrupt normal circulation in your brain via these sympathetic fibers that affect the artery flow in and the lymphatic flow out. And so if and when you have this kind of a dysregulation, guess what's going to happen? It means that your brain is effectively getting choked off of its normal circulation supply. And guess what's going to happen over a period of time or sometimes even instantly? You're just turning your head and, oh, everything just feels really fuzzy all of a sudden. Odds are it's because there's a circulation issue that is actually causing that kind of condition. Now, in addition to that, if and when you actually have something that is affecting the upper part of your neck that's also affecting the circulation within your brain, you know, even if you are having this normal sympathetic nerve control, you can still have where the fluid is simply put not moving the way that it's supposed to. And there have been numerous studies that have been done to show the influence of the upper part of a person's neck on the way that the circulation flows in the brain. Now, if in particular the circulation within your brain is not flowing the way that it should be, when you lie down, the tendency is, is where the normal fluid is able to drain out of your brain, out of the, the big veins that you have up in the front here. They're called the internal jugular veins. But when you stand up, when you sit up, for that matter, those veins have the tendency to close. And the only space where it can actually get out is through the very back of your head. But if you've got a particular kind of misalignment, again, that essentially chokes off that secondary supply, it's called the cerebrospinal venous system. Well, what can happen then is when you are upright, you're not able to properly drain the fluid from inside of your brain. So one of the common things that people will say if this is the case is they will say, I feel better when I lie down, but the longer that I am upright over the course of the day, the worse that I feel. That really is the telltale sign right then and there. Something is not going right in this area. And whether it's related with a balance issue, whether it's related with headache, whether it's related with pain, whether it's related with brain fog, it means it's like have a proper look at this area to find out what is actually going on because, again, all of those symptoms are effects. The question then is what's the underlying cause? Because if you can get to the root cause, that then gives you the better opportunity to find a long-term solution. So what are we proposing here, at least as a hypothesis? We're hypothesizing that when it comes to brain fog, brain fog is the byproduct of there being localized inflammation in and on the brain, specifically of the vessels that are involved with circulation in and around the brain, which is one of the reasons why it typically doesn't show up on MRI scans. 
You see, to get to the point where you can actually see inflammation on an MRI or any other scan, you normally need to have a lot of accumulated damage before you get to that point. Very often, it can take, you know, 40 to 50 percent loss of the normal function before anything starts to show up on a scan like that at all. So people can have an MRI or a CT or an X-ray and the results can come back and say everything is normal and they can go back to their neurologist or their doctor and say, you know, what do you mean? How can everything possibly be normal when I'm feeling the way that I am? It's because when you're dealing with circulation issues in the brain stemming from a problem with the neck, we aren't dealing with over pathology, like a tumor, like a bleed, like an infection, something that you can see. This is something that's happening at a functional level. And even though it's happening, quote, relatively small, because it affects your brain, it can have huge, huge knock-on effects. So when you've got then that condition that's affecting the circulation in the brain, the question is, well, what's causing it? And there's can be a lot of different things causing it. I am not here to say that, oh, the neck is the cause of brain fog. That is not always the case. There are a lot of other contributing factors. But can it be one of the missing pieces of the puzzle? Yes. One is because of the upper neck's direct relationship on the brain stem, on the spinal cord, and the way that the fluid normally circulates inside of your skull. But the second reason is because of your upper neck's unique relationship on the sympathetic blood vessels, excuse me, these sympathetic nerve fibers that control the blood vessels and that control the lymphatic channels, which are normally involved with circulation to and from your brain, so that all of those brain cells are able to work and function the way that they are supposed to. So if that's the case, and if you are experiencing something along the brain the lines of brain fog, what do we recommend? Well, one of the things that I would always recommend, first and foremost, look at your diet. Why? because diet is a major source of inflammation in your body. Now, if you don't have any inflammation in your body and it's only affecting your head, odds are it's not your diet, if that's the case. So that's a good thing. But what it also means then at that point, probably super important, if you haven't already done so, is making sure that you get somebody to properly check the alignment, the function, the stability of your upper neck. And in this regard, of course, I'm going to be recommending an upper cervical chiropractor, not just because that's, you know, what I do, because I know that this video is going to be reaching a number of people who are outside my area of being able to actually assist you. But unlike somebody who just does, you know, general work in the neck, an upper cervical specific chiropractor is somebody who really specializes in this area. They find out what's the unique combination and the array of things that are actually involved with you. Because especially when you're dealing something with brain function, with spinal cord function, with really vital life function, you don't want to be doing things willy-nilly. You want to be as precise as you possibly can because you better believe if even the, the littlest bit of change, positive change, can provide the relief from brain fog, from full body pain, from all that sort of stuff. If you don't get it quite right, unfortunately, nothing happens, or you can unfortunately sometimes make worse as well. And of course, we don't want to do that. But I do want to nevertheless give hope for people out there who do experience the symptom of brain fog that it may not be all in their head. It could be actually just that little bit below. I'll share with you myself is that if my own neck goes out of alignment, previous sports injuries, forceps delivery, lucky me, all of these things, one of the things that I will also experience, my brain will get foggy. It My it, head just does not work as well when I'm in alignment, excuse me, my head does not work as well when I'm out of alignment as when I'm in. And it's oftentimes, it is a night and day difference in terms of just the ease and the function. And sometimes people actually think, oh, okay, yep, yep, this is just, you know, normal. This is the way it's supposed to be. When you experience that difference for yourself, 
you've got that contract. You know that this is not supposed to be normal, that we get used to tolerating a lot of things that we attribute to stress, getting older, or it's just me. It's just my genetics. It's just hereditary. It's just my anatomy. There's nothing that I can do about it when nothing could be further from the truth. So if nothing else here, what I hope is I hope that this gives you some understanding about the nature of brain fog itself, why it's not something where we can just put a, a nice little label, give you the nice little diagnosis and say on your tests, ah, here is the actual cause of it, but recognizing that it's going to be the byproduct. It's the effect of something that's affecting your brain in a certain way where it's most likely not receiving the right amount of circulation that it needs to. So if you can find out what is actually affecting it at that level, and if you can find that resolution, it does not necessarily need to be something that you just simply have to put up with, live with day after day. You can get your brain working at a higher level. You can get your life working at a better level. It just means finding out what is it that you actually need to help restore that normal life flow. So thank you guys, as always, for watching this video. If you found it valuable, informative, number one, please do click the like and subscribe button. Number two is if you think that there is somebody who would benefit from watching this, please do share it with friends, family, whoever that would be. Number three, please do go to our website, which is clearchirospokane.com, where we've got a list of all kinds of other blog articles, videos, like this about a number of different topics ultimately that go to helping improve